Hello everyone, it's me, John Lorden, and I'm back with another brain scratch. And for this one, um, I've got to tell you just a little bit of a personal story, um, rolling back to the start of brain scratch. I had just put out, I don't know, maybe four or five episodes of brain scratch, and I was contacted by someone that wanted to um, work on a case with me, kind of as something like a brain scratch researcher would be now. And uh, his name was Emre, he lived in Turkey, and he was uh, very interested in something known as the Long Island Serial Killer, which I had no uh, previous knowledge of. And he had been investigating this case pretty much in the same way we do brain scratch. You know, he's doing a virtual investigation, he's using the internet to try to source information. Um, he sent me uh, a bunch of push pins for Google Earth that were very helpful in terms of showing me um, where some of these bodies had been found. Um, and it was really cool in one way because there is kind of the first time I had a glimpse of someone helping me with a case. But it also kind of broke my heart in another way because communicating with him became extremely difficult. Um, it was the best way for me to describe it is saying that it was kind of like dealing with the Riddler. <laughs> if you can imagine um, working with the Riddler on something, I mean the Riddler from Batman, uh, he just would constantly ask these questions and I really liked some of the questions because uh, they of course would make me think and think about things differently than I normally would, but I could never really get a sense of where he was trying to lead the conversation and once he had kind of shot me, I don't know if it was all of his information, but a significant amount of his information, we hit this sticky point in the conversation that we just couldn't get around. He wanted uh, me to consider some things that just didn't feel natural to me or proper or feel like they fit into this case and we hit this kind of unfortunate end to it. Um, now, I've thought about this case for a long, long time and how to even present it on Brain Scratch because, quite honestly, I've seen a lot of TV shows cover it and the coverage on it is, it's not great, it's not the most detailed, and it's very hard to do detailed coverage on this story because of how big it is. Now, if you watched Geek and Dork's reviews this week, you know that I was, I watched Dreamcatcher and did a review of that as kind of a primer to this story. Um, and that is because the Long Island serial killer seems to focus on prostitutes. And that is where we will start with the first step in what might be a series. I honestly don't know. I'm going to look to your responses. Um, I'm going to look to your comments and reactions and other information that you provide and see if I should continue this or not. But this episode is going to serve as an entry point into the Long Island serial killer. I'm going to focus specifically on the story of Shannon Gilbert, and that's who you can see in all these photographs behind me, um, because she is really the catalyst that um, kind of helped this theory be discovered, but uh, has also shaken a lot of other things loose in this case that we're going to touch on by the end of this episode. So with all that being said, let's get started. So here you can see a lot of pictures of Shannon, just a pretty young woman. Um, she had dreams of possibly being a singer, possibly being an actress. Uh, she was taking some writing classes, but unfortunately she had also fallen into a lifestyle of prostitution. And in terms of being a prostitute, she did have some practices that you think might ensure her safety. For example, she would use a driver, someone that was paid specifically to drive her to a location, but they would also wait for her. So it's almost like a, a safety of, of some type so that you know there's someone out there waiting for you. If you don't show back up, then that person knows that something went wrong. Um, her safety for the last job that she worked, his name was Michael Pack. Um, and he's going to come up a bit, a bit later in this story. Um, it's weird. I'm going to try to just tell this story off the top of my head because I've done so much research with Emre on this. I've literally watched dozens and dozens of hours of footage. I've reviewed multiple websites. As a matter of fact, if you look in the description box below, you're going to see more links than you've ever seen to any brain scratch before. I'm not going to cover all the information that's in those links, but know that if you want to do a truly deep dive into this case, that description box below is a great way to um, jump into many aspects of the case. You have links down there to 
Um, the police, the now retired police commissioner of Suffolk County, um, that's a seven-parter just watching through all his stuff. And those, I think the total on that was over six hours. And yes, I watched every minute of it. Um, so there's a ton of research around this case that you can jump into. But going off the top of my head, so Shannon Gilbert gets called for a job um, near the Gilgo Beach area. Um, it's a kind of affluent, gated community. There are uh, just a handful of houses, um, but there is a guard that works at the gate. He knows that she is arriving, and I believe this is sometime between 1 a.m. and 2 a.m. Um, she goes to the John's house, and she's supposed to be there only for two hours, but it seems like that gets stretched out a little bit. Um, at some point, so we're now looking at, in the middle of the morning, um, at some point she calls 911 and she is screaming, they're going to kill me, they're going to kill me, I need help. And the 911 operator uh, keeps asking her, where are you, where are you? And unfortunately that's probably one of the downsides of having a driver. Shannon wasn't really responsible for getting herself to the location, so she didn't have a very good understanding of where she actually was, this, uh, this private community. So. Um, she runs, uh, actually she doesn't run, the John goes out to uh, the driver and tries to bring him inside the house and says, get her out of here, get her out of here. And at that point, she runs from both of them and she goes through the neighborhood. She runs to an older man's house and this is coming up on about 5 a.m. or something when, when this is going on. Um, she pounds on his door, I need help, I need help. He opens the door. He lets her in, but she only steps into the doorway. Um, she keeps talking about, they're, they're following me, they're going to kill me. So he decides to call 911. At that point, she runs outside again. Um, and it seems like she's worried about this car that's following her. Well, the car is her driver that is basically trying to find her. Um, she hides under a boat of the older man's house that she's at. Um, and then once the driver gets close to her there, she flees again and goes further down the neighborhood. She runs to a woman's house, bangs on the door, they're trying to kill me, help, I need help. And the woman, unfortunately, does not open the door, but she also calls 911. At this point, um, things get a little fuzzy and there is a story that comes out. There's a, a former emergency room doctor that lives in this area. And when you look into his backstory, his name's Dr. Hackett. Um, he's a little, he's a little bit weird. Um, he's a guy that likes to insert himself into the middle of other people's uh, stories. Uh, he likes to even provide medical treatment, supposedly, uh, outside of his house, just for his neighbors. If they need something, uh, they can come by, and he's acting like he's still uh, an acting doctor outside of his house, and. It's questionable if she gets to his house or not, um, but her mother, Shannon's mother, received a phone call from Dr. Hackett at one point in which he says, I run a shelter for troubled women, and yes, Shannon was here, and uh, I treated her, but then uh, she disappeared, she ran off, and I don't know where she went. He later denies that whole story. He says he didn't call the mom, he doesn't know what she's talking about, but police investigate his phone records and they can tell that it was actually, if I remember correctly, his wife's cell phone that he called from. And they prove that, yes, you did actually call Shannon's mother. Um, but he still uh, denies the account of, of what happened to her. So from there, let's jump to a news story so we can pick it up a little bit. So now we're going to take a look at cbsnews.com and know that you can come here and they have their episode of 48 hours available to watch here. I also suggest that you might check that out. Um, it's pretty good and definitely just another way to get a bit of an overall view about the Long Island serial killer case. The Gilberts say they immediately filed a missing persons report, but with no news, they drove 140 miles from their home to upstate New York to Oak Beach, Long Island to look for Shannon themselves, but then she had been missing for eight days. They spoke to a dozen witnesses and homeowners in the area trying to piece together a timeline. They learned that Shannon and her driver had left New York City shortly after midnight on May 1st, 2010 and headed to a gated community in Oak Beach. My sister met the client through Craigslist 
and went to his house around 2 a.m., Cherie explained. Her driver dropped her off and she was there for quite a while, and then, for some reason, she started to panic. Uh, the article then talks about the 911 call, the same information I already gave you, and that the operator was trying to get her to say where she was, but she couldn't. Still on the 911 call, Shannon fled the house, running towards the nearby home of Gus Coletti, a retired insurance fraud investigator and resident of Oak Beach for over 30 years. It was like 5 in the morning, Coletti recalled. I was in the bathroom shaving. All of a sudden, I heard screaming out here and banging on that door, yelling, help me, help me, help me. He opened the door, and I said to her, what's the matter? She wouldn't answer me. She just kept staring at me and going, help me, help me, help me. So, of course, at this point, um, you're probably thinking, and the police thought this also, is she in some type of psychotic state? It is worth mentioning she did suffer from bipolar disorder, um, and any of you that watched my other videos, you know that it seems like uh, law enforcement likes to look at that reasoning and uh, sometimes believes that, oh, this person just kind of flipped out and went crazy, and that's an excuse that they definitely seem to lean on in this case a bit, but let's continue. But when the police arrived at 5.40 a.m., Shannon Gilbert had vanished. They assumed she had already left the area with her driver, Michael Pack. All the responding officers can believe at this point is that whoever was in the SUV picked up this girl and they're gone, said Baroni. Chief Baroni says the local police responding to Coletti's call knew nothing about Shannon's own 23-minute 911 call. What has never been reported before is that Shannon's call was transferred to the New York State Police when she couldn't tell them where she was. It took nearly a month for police to connect Shannon's desperate phone call to the missing persons report her family had filed in New Jersey, where Shannon lived. And these types of problems seem to plague this case. Just miscommunication, um, information being held by one police department and not getting to the appropriate police department to be processed. Um, hopefully, some new systems have been put in place to try to help curb this, but um, this, this, you know, this is only happening in 2010, so um, it, it's pretty shocking to me that considering all of our integration with computers and the internet that this information was not put in a place where it could be found easily by the authorities that needed it, but that seems to be the case. Now one of the big questions I had, and websleuths.com is going to help us with the answer here, um, one of the questions I had was why could the 911 operator not detect where she was? Um, from everything I've seen, when you call 911, um, I believe your address actually usually pops up on the screen. But here we have a posting um, from someone named Trigger. Not all 911 calls can be triangulated. You can put in latitude and longitude, but for some reason, sometimes, it just doesn't generate their location. Being a 911 operator, this happens all too frequently. People call hysterical, they are so upset, and they don't know where they are. It's so frustrating and I feel for this 911 operator. That is why I always ask them to give me license plate numbers of cars parked in the general area. It works for me. So supposedly um, the type of system I'm imagining that we all have is not quite the case and it seems like once again information systems seem to be failing in this case of helping Shannon get out of what seems like some type of imminent danger. So at this point, you're probably wondering, John, how does this all relate to some type of serial killer? We're just talking about what's going on with this one girl, and we don't even know what really happened to her outside of uh, something scared her, and she went running off. Well, they started looking for her body in this area, and um, they found some bones. Now, what is also interesting about Shannon is she actually had a metal plate in part of her jaw. Um, unfortunately, she was roughed up by uh, her boyfriend at one point. Um, so they find some bones, and I think they pretty quickly determine that those bones are not, in fact, Shannon because the metal plate is, is not there. Then they find another set, and another set, and another set. Let's jump to Wikipedia and take a look at their entry for the Long Island Serial Killer. The Long Island Serial Killer, also referred to by media sources as the Gilgo Beach Killer or the Craigslist Ripper, is an unidentified suspect American serial killer who is believed to have murdered 10 to 17 people associated with the sex trade over a period of nearly 20 years and dumped their bodies along the Ocean Parkway near the remote Long Island Beach towns of Gilgo Beach and Oak Beach in Suffolk County, and the area of Jones 
Beach State Park in Nassau County. The remains of four victims were found in December 2010, while six more sets of remains were found in March and April of 2011. Police believe that the latest set of remains predate the four bodies found in December 2010. On May 9, 2011, authorities surmised that two of the newest sets of remains might be the work of a second killer. On November 29, 2011, however, the police announced that they believe that one person is responsible for all 10 deaths and that they did not believe that the case of Shannon Gilbert, an escort who was missing when the first set of bodies were found, was related. Now, they think that most of the other cases are related because uh, when they're conducting their autopsies, they're recognizing what is called a hyoid bone, uh, which is a part of your neck, and frequently when people are choked to death, that bone gets broken. And in several of these cases, that bone was indeed broken. Um, they also identified that s I think four of these bodies were wrapped in some type of burlap sack. Um, if you do watch the videos down below with the former um, chief of police, Dormer, you will see that he is very reluctant to talk about what type of sack that is. Um, you know, burlap sacks, I mean, yes, they are common to a point, but most burlap sacks are made for some type of product. Sometimes they have a stamp or some kind of marker on them. Some people have theorized, you know, is this a gardener that is conducting these crimes because he has access to this type of burlap sack for some reason. Um, but we know that at least in four of the cases, they were dumped at this location in the same matter, um, wrapped in burlap sack. But not buried. These bodies were um, just a little bit literally off of the road as if someone had pulled over and um, it's, there's, it's a very dense uh, thick brush that is right off the side of that road and literally I think like 6 to 12 feet into that brush the bodies were just thrown and dumped. They weren't uh, covered in any way outside of if there was a burlap sack around them. So. Um, it appears that this killer um, liked this dumping location, used it a lot, and was pretty brazen in terms of how he left the bodies out there um, to be discovered. What's kind of a miracle in all this is that the search for Shannon uncovered all of these other murders that uh, we didn't even know had happened. Now, some of these families did report um, some of these people as missing, but then other, uh, at least in one case, one of the families didn't report the girl as missing because they knew that she was a prostitute and they just thought she was off working or had disappeared or, or had gone of her own volition in some way. Um, and once again, this calls back to that relationship that um, I was bringing up in my Geek and Dorks review this week about what we think about prostitutes. Um, are they, do we look at them as less than people? Um, and at this point, I want to recommend, there's a book specifically about um, these girls called Lost Girls. And I highly suggest you check that out. Um, the author did some really good research, reached out to the family, got the backstory of these girls. And when you read through that book, if you have that perception where you're feeling like they're less than people for some reason, this book will pretty much straighten that out. It just gives you so much information about these being real people, having their own dreams and aspirations, but unfortunately some of them are dealing with addictions, some of them are dealing with problems that led them into this lifestyle, um, which is unfortunate. And then of course, this tragedy of this lifestyle, um, you know, being a target. This isn't the first time that we've had a serial killer that has targeted prostitutes in particular. If you've heard of Joel Rifkin, um, he was infamous for doing the same thing. As a matter of fact, there is some belief that some of the remains might be related to his work. However, he was interviewed and he completely denies that. He says that none of the remains that they've found in this case are related to anything that he had done. So this Wikipedia goes into each of the bodies being discovered. Um, like I said, for this episode of Brain Scratch, it's a bit too much detail to dive into. However, on December 13th, 2011, the remains of Shannon Gilbert were found in a marsh about a half mile from where she disappeared, and a week after, some of her clothes and belongings were found in the vicinity. Police believe that Shannon accidentally drowned after stumbling into a swamp, a view not shared by her mother. The belongings that were found that they're talking about um, were actually found very close to what many people would consider the backyard of Dr. Hackett. Here comes that guy again. And uh, they found, I believe, her jean shorts, 
I think they found her purse there and her cell phone. So those are some very important items. Her body was found about a half a mile away from her personal effects. And once again, we're talking very um, thick and dense area and kind of marshy land. Um, what's interesting about them thinking that she fell and drowned in some way is that apparently when she was found, she was found face up. And it is not common for people um, to drown in that matter. I, I would suppose that if the water level was higher for some reason, um, maybe she had drowned and then the water level kind of lowered and then her body was left in that position and making it seem a bit more odd. Um, however, we'll see some information a bit later that uh, might even contradict that. But the official statement for police at this point in the story is accidental death. Does this sound familiar, folks? Girl goes crazy, uh, girl with bipolar disorder in particular, um, goes crazy, flips out, goes running off into the dark, starts removing her clothes, and then accidentally dies in a body of water. I know, makes me want to shake my head right through the, the screen sometimes, but let's continue. Reddit uh, has a very good thread going on this, and um, they have some information about the theory about her taking drugs. So let's check this out. There are a number of problems with this official theory. First, her toxicology report came back negative. No drugs found in her system. Second, she was found lying face up, which is not something you would generally expect in a drowning victim. They never did the relatively simple test to confirm she drowned. Third, she had called 911 when she fled. She was on the phone with them for over 20 minutes. Why did they wait six months to look for her? Question mark, question mark. Um, they have never released her 911 call. They have never even released a full transcript of her 911 call. We do know that she said they're trying to kill me. Uh, fourth, her pants, cell phone, and pocketbook were found a half mile away from her. Not her clothing, just her pants and maybe panties, which isn't what you would expect for a classical paradoxical undressing. So the state that her body is found in is considerably different than the other bodies that are being found. I mean, they could basically identify fairly easily that those other bodies were dumped at that location. What's different about Shannon's part of the story and what I consider kind of the main brain scratch for this episode is the question, is her death related to the Long Island serial killer? Is her story part of those other 10 bodies that are found? And that was a question that has been debated very hotly um, for the past several years. Although some new information seems to have shaken out, um, which might push us a bit closer to believing that that's the case. Um, but what I find very important about this is with the other bodies, it's extremely hard to tell what happened because all that the police have is the dumping location. Um, they theorized that these sex workers were likely tortured maybe for days, potentially weeks, uh, before they were killed and then taken to this drop spot. If you imagine the forensics of trying to investigate a crime when you don't even have the crime scene, all you have is the dumping location. So that's not the scene where most likely the torture happened. That's not the scene where um, their death may have even occurred. So it's very hard to investigate this case looking at the information that they have um, specifically just of those bodies being dumped in that location. However, if you add Shannon to this theory, then you have a very different situation because we have a lot of data about where she was, who she was interacting with, um, her emotional state that she was going through, and where her body wound up, which was only a few miles away from where the other bodies were dumped. So is it possible that the Long Island serial killer is living in that private gated community? Is it possible that uh, she was just the next victim and she was able to escape before uh, really bad things happened? And that changed the MO, changed the story for how she was killed and disposed of? I think there's some viability to that, especially when you check out the latest news in this case. So let's take a look first at the NewYorkPost.com, an article just from December 12th, 2015. Disgraced former Suffolk County Police Chief James Burke, who was denied bail on a misconduct case Friday, stymied the FBI's investigation into the Gilgo Beach serial killings for years, the Post has learned. 
Burke, who was busted Wednesday for allegedly assaulting a Smithtown man in 2012, refused to keep the feds in the loop on the unsolved murders of eight women, a man, and a toddler on or near the beach, a source said. Yes, so we have a police chief literally obstructing the investigation when the FBI is trying to find out what is going on with this serial case investigation. Um, as a result of this, I believe the FBI is now directly involved. I saw mentioned in a few articles about them um, now joining this investigation and trying to see it through. Um, and from what I understand, Chief James Burke here was embarrassed um, because this guy that he beat up uh, found a bag full of sex toys and pornography of his. Um, why that would stop you from trying to allow the investigation into a serial killer, man, you really got to check yourself out and maybe get some help about that because it just it boggles my mind that, that this even came out. Now, in terms of Shannon, there has been some information, and this news article is from CNN.com, just from February 12th of this year. Report, Shannon Gilbert could have been strangled. In a statement, Suffolk County Police Commissioner Timothy Sinai said his department is, quote, doing everything it can to solve the Gilgo Beach homicides, and that is why the department recently partnered with the FBI. I'm sure that's not the only reason. I'm pretty sure that uh, people are wondering what the heck's going on in that department with that last story we looked at. Suffolk County Police announced in December that the FBI had joined the Gilgo Beach investigation. Later Friday, Sinai said homicide investigators had reviewed a letter highlighting the new autopsy findings. It provides no additional information and concludes, as did the Suffolk County Office of the Medical Examiner, that there is insufficient information to determine a definite cause of death, Sinai said. Bill Gilbert's death certificate listed the cause and manner of death as undetermined. An independent autopsy by former New York Chief Medical Examiner Michael Baden concluded, there is no evidence that she died of a natural disease, of a drug overdose, or of drowning. There is insufficient information to determine a definite cause of death, but the autopsy findings are consistent with homicidal strangulation, Baden wrote in the report released Thursday. Baden wrote that nearly all of Gilbert's recovered skeletal remains appeared normal, but the larynx was missing, and only the body of the hyoid bone was found. The two greater horns of that neck bone were missing. These structures, the larynx and the hyoid bone, are often fractured during homicidal manual strangulation. So in light of these findings, it now looks that, first of all, um, this death was not accidental, uh, not a natural death, and sh her story is starting to fit the MO of the other cases that were found where we know that strangulation was used to kill several of those people. Um, so still the question uh, is squarely in my lap, is Shannon Gilbert part of the Long Island serial killer case? And if so, um, does that mean that we should be looking at those people she was interacting with on that final night? Well, we have a little bit more information to consider there too. This is an article from AOL News that states the Craigslist escort Shannon Gilbert may have been tortured before death. This is from February 13th, 2016. An independent autopsy commissioned by the family of Craigslist escort Shannon Gilbert revealed that a hole may have been drilled in the hyoid bone near her throat, according to lawyer John Ray. Now, I haven't found any other mentions of that, but um, man, that is pretty disturbing if that is indeed the case. Once again, this article is reviewing those statements that we covered made by Baden. Um, but here, there's some new information I didn't see in the other articles. The Gilbert family has filed a civil lawsuit against Dr. C. Peter Hackett, a former Suffolk County Police Department surgeon. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't know he was a police department surgeon. Um, one of the things that came up in theories around this case is that this person might have been law enforcement, the serial killer, um, because they seem to know law enforcement procedures and how to uh, get around them. For example, in one of the cases, they use the cell phone of his victim to call the younger sister and taunt her several times. Now, the police were able to um, use cell phone towers to determine where those phone calls happened, and they came from extremely public places that were hard to use video surveillance to determine uh, who he was. I think 
possibly Times Square, but um, places where there's so much foot traffic that even if you had video surveillance, you couldn't peg down the one person using his cell phone. Um, knowing that he worked for a police department, he might be privy to some of their processes. Um, if you do watch some of the documentaries on this, you will see investigators that talk about this case and they regularly comment, hey look, we have so many television shows now showing police procedures that uh, is it really hard to believe that someone could have picked this up from just watching TV and being interested in that subject. So um, I don't know if it's necessarily a strong thought to think that this is someone that was related to police work that is the Long Island serial killer, but a uh, pretty interesting little tidbit here about Dr. Hackett. Gilbert's mother said Dr. Hackett had called her shortly after Gilbert went missing and said he had medicated Shannon to calm her down. Dr. Hackett has been deposed three times in the civil case. After the most recent deposition in the fall of 2015, Hackett collapsed and crawled on the ground when a TV crew approached him from Crime Watch Daily and said the crew affected his heart defibrillator. He had never been criminally charged in connection with the Gilbert case or the larger serial killer investigation. He is now living in Florida. So, um, pretty interesting and once again, um, I feel pretty strongly that if you're a family member facing a case like this and you're trying to find the truth, especially after this number of years, unfortunately sometimes kicking off civil suits like this is the only way that you could get some of those records released. So uh, if nothing else, I hope that this gives them some more insight into the police investigation records so they could possibly use that for their uh, their civil suit against Dr. Hackett. And you have to wonder, why did this guy lie? Why is he lying about this? Um, I saw some investigators that had interviewed him and they kind of wrote it off to, oh, he's just one of those guys, he likes to tell stories. Um, I don't know if that's a very reasonable excuse for someone making a phone call to a victim's mother and then uh, becoming, you know, kind of inserting himself into this whole fiasco. It seems very, very strange to me. I also saw some mention that he apparently made that phone call from her neighborhood, that he was pretty close to her house when he made that call. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but if it is, um, man, he's looking like a definite person of interest in my eyes. So there is so much more to cover in this case. We have only scratched the surface, um, but let me know what you think in the comments below. The main question for this episode is, is the Shannon Gilbert case connected to the other Long Island serial killings? That's my main question here. If we can prove or disprove that connection, that kind of changes our focus a bit. If she is connected, then we can look at the actions of that night, we can look at the people she interacted with, and all of a sudden we have a pretty healthy list of people of interest. If she is not connected and those other killings are done by someone else, Unfortunately, it puts us back at square one um, where we're working on the official police profile, uh, which by the way is a middle-aged white man um, who is gainfully employed, uh, but they really haven't released much more than that. Each one of these murders is its own story. Um, each one of these women and um, just let me straighten out because I know I said that there was a man and also a baby found. The theory is that the baby is the child of one of the sex workers, um, that maybe the baby was with her at the time that she was going to perform her job. The man uh, was an Asian man, but he was found in women's clothing, so possibly a cross-dresser. Um, and apparently the damage done to his body was a bit different than the others. It looked like he had been very severely uh, beaten, so it could be one potential theory is that the killer thought it was a woman, found out it was a man, became enraged, and did what he was uh, what, what he was going to do in a bit of a different way. So um, there's so much to this case, but that's it for this edition of Brain Scratch. Thank you for sticking around with me on this one. I know it's a huge topic; it's very hard to get to it all. But hopefully, this uh, is a good entry point for any of you that want to dig in deeper. Please use all the links that I have in the description box below. Let me know if you find any new information or have any thoughts or conclusions on this. And I will catch you next time on the Geek and Dorks channel. Take care.